Good morning, guys. Today we're going to take a look at the uh, beginnings of chapter 12, which is a look at uh, life and how uh, citizens in the United States lived in the northern states. We're going to start off with chapter 12, section 1. Chapter 12, section 1 is titled The Industrial Revolution in America. I have three objectives for you today. Uh, number one, your vocab words. Uh, be able to define industrial revolution, interchangeable parts, and mass production. My second objective, be able to identify Eli Whitney. And then finally, my third objective, describe how the industrial revolution transformed the way goods were made in the United States. First topic we're going to talk about today is the industrial revolution. At the beginning of the 1700s, so going back, way back to the beginning of the class almost, uh, most people in Europe and America were farmers. The vast majority of people were. If something was needed by people, they made it by hand. They didn't go to the store and buy goods. They made it from whatever they had in their home. Uh, however, in, in about the mid-1700s in Great Britain, the traditional way of producing things uh, was not efficient enough to produce enough products. Britain's population was rapidly expanding, and they needed newer ways to make higher quality manufactured goods, but also many, many more manufactured goods. This desire to more efficiently produce manufactured goods led to what's known as the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution is the period of rapid growth using machines for manufacturing and production that began in Great Britain during the mid-1700s. Uh, some historians today don't like the term Industrial Revolution because they think the word revolution connotates or means that it happened all of a sudden. Like at one point we had industrialization and or we had no factories and then all of a sudden we had factories when in reality it was a slow process. Today a lot of historians like to use the word industrialization instead of industrial revolution, but uh, we're going to go ahead and use it because most people still use the term. Uh, important thing, it began in the mid-1700s and did not begin in the United States. Uh, Great Britain actually went through this process uh, about 50 to 60 years prior to the United States uh, going through it. And the first breakthrough with the use of factories took place in the textiles industry. Textiles is, is a fancy word for cloth items. Uh, and it happened in 1769. An Englishman by the name of uh, Richard uh, Arkwright invented this device that's on your screen right here. It's known as the water frame. The water frame could produce dozens of cotton threads at the same time. The traditional way of making a cotton thread was to take cotton yarn from the cotton plant and you had a single person that sat on a spinning wheel and would and would tighten it and spin it into a single thread of yarn. Well, uh, as you're going to see here on this next video, the water frame used the power of water from a nearby creek or river to spin multiple uh, threads of uh, cotton at the same time, sometimes dozens of them at the same time. Obviously, if you have a machine producing dozens of uh, threads of cotton, which is going to be used to make clothing, instead of one person having to sit and do one thread or spool of cotton, uh, it's going to make it much cheaper and you're going to get a lot more cotton. This video here I think is going to illustrate how it worked pretty well for you. Uh, before I get to the video though, here's kind of what a textile mill would look like using the water frame. You had a water wheel that would spin gears and those would be those gears would be connected to these water frame machines you're going to see here in a second that would spin uh, cotton thread onto a, a spinning frame. This video here will show it probably a little bit better than I can actually explain it to you. It was created by the famous English inventor Richard Arkwright, this model is from the 1780s, to spin cotton in the yard. Though it looks fairly complex, it really isn't. In 
It runs on water power, just like the carding machine and saw blades we saw earlier. The cotton in the top screws is drawn out by the action of the machine, which twists it nice and tight, and then gathers the yarn onto these bottom screws. It works just like a hand spinning wheel. 96 of them, actually. So it's little wonder that spinning by machine would eventually make spinning by hand possible. In no time, spinning mills began springing up all over. Okay, so now that <clears throat> cotton can be spun into thread rapidly with not a whole lot of people being required, making cotton clothing is going to become very, very cheap. Think about all the things that are made out of cotton. Just take a look at the clothing that you have sometime. Almost everything you own uh, that's clothing has cotton in it. And that would not be possible without those... Uh, Machines that actually were first invented in the 1700s. Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is these new machines and processes that helped bring the Industrial Revolution to the United States. And here's the man that actually got it started right here. Samuel Slater. And he had a secret. Great Britain knew uh, that this device was going to be very valuable. And they wanted to make sure they protected the device. So Great Britain's Parliament passed several laws that made it illegal for anybody involved in the textile industry to immigrate anywhere else or for any plans for these spinning machines okay, to uh, ever be taken anywhere else. Well, a mechanic on one of these machines by the name of Samuel Slater realized that he could become very rich if he could get out of Great Britain. So he disguised himself as a farmer, uh, made up a different identity, got aboard a ship in Great Britain, and immigrated to the United States. He brought with him the secrets of uh, Richard uh, Arkwright's water frame spinning device. When he reached the United States, he contacted the textile businessman by the name of Moses Brown. Uh, Moses Brown had two business partners, his son, Smith Brown, and uh, his son-in-law, William L. Uh, Almy and Samuel Slater agreed to sell them his secret if they would take him into his business. Together, the four of them opened this mill right here, still uh, exists as a museum in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and they became extremely wealthy uh, in the textile business. They had built uh, over a dozen different textile mills that looked very similar to this along rivers, and Almost overnight, the secret's getting out across America, especially in New England, and textile mills are beginning to sprout up all over the New England states. Uh, most of them were in New England. Very few ever uh, were in the South because the South was focused primarily on agriculture and growing tobacco and growing cotton. For these textile mills to take off, you need cotton, so the South primarily was uh, supplying that cotton. Okay, so that's just one aspect of what started the Industrial Revolution in the United States. There, there has to be something else as well. It can't just be about uh, cotton thread. And Eli Whitney and a potential war with France is what's going to lead to the rest of it. In the late 1790s, you might, might remember going back to John Adams' administration, President John Adams, when we talked about the XYZ affair, uh, there was a real threat of going to war with France. The United States in the 1790s realized if we went to war with France, we were going to need a ton of weapons. And the local gun manufacturers could not supply uh, the number of guns required from Congress. Back during the 1790s, to make a gun, it was made by hand. Each individual gun was made by a single gunsmith working in his shop. And none of them could make the number of guns required uh, for the United States Army. That was until 1798. An inventor by the name of Eli Whitney, who we're going to talk about later as well, uh, he becomes famous for something uh, 
else later, but Eli Whitney came up with the revolutionary idea of what's known as interchangeable parts. Today for us, it seems kind of a no-duh idea, but back then it was revolutionary. His idea of interchangeable parts was that parts of any machine that's manufactured should be made identical with each new product that you make. Okay? This idea right here made it so that if you were going to make 10 guns, those 10 guns would look exactly the same because their parts would be exactly the same. So think about that. Instead of making one gun, uh, one person making one gun, how about you get 10 people together, each of them makes a separate part of the gun, and then you put them all together. You can change the parts out if a part breaks, get a new part and interchange it, interchangeable parts, and that just makes the process go that much quicker. So using interchangeable parts made machines easier to assemble and broken parts easier to replace. Whitney promised that he could produce 10,000 muskets in a period of, of two years. This was unheard of. This is actually a picture of what his musket looked like. You saw the diagram of it on the previous screen. The government agreed to give him a contract and help him build a factory outside of Washington, D.C. if he could prove that this would work. So Eli Whitney took the pieces of 10 separate muskets that he'd made, took them to John Adams and, and part of John Adams' administration, and, and took turns assembling different muskets over and over from this group of interchangeable parts. He test fired each gun and they kept working even though he kept mixing and matching the parts. Uh, this was enough to convince John Adams and his administration and they gave a contract to Eli Whitney and the idea of interchangeable parts began to take off. Whitney's influence proved to American inventors that they could take British ideas and improve upon them. And this idea of interchangeable parts led to the idea of mass production. Mass production is the efficient of pr production of large numbers of identical goods. Instead of one person sitting in a shop making one item and then making the item over again, build a factory where you get dozens or hundreds of people working together using interchangeable parts and mass produce items. That's going to make them cheaper and you're going to have a whole lot more of them. This is what leads to the Industrial Revolution in the United States. This idea of interchangeable parts and mass production. The idea though started off slowly. Manufacturing grew slowly in the United States in the early 1800s. It wasn't until the War of 1812 actually that manufacturing began to take off. And think back to what we learned about the War of 1812. Uh, the United States could not trade with other countries because Great Britain blockaded uh, our coastline. They stopped all of our trade. So this actually caused the Industrial Revolution to hit in the United States. We could no longer buy goods from France, goods from Spain, goods from Great Britain. We had to buy from American factories. So by the end of the war in 1815, the American manufacturing economy had begun to rapidly expand because Americans were forced to buy American. Guys, there's three main things we talked about today. The invention of new machines in Great Britain, uh, specifically with the textile industry, launched the Industrial Revolution in the mid-1700s in Great Britain. It was a little bit slower in the United States. We talked about the process, though, of the development of new machines and processes that brought the Industrial Revolution to the United States in the uh, early 1800s. It started off slowly in the United States, but began to rapidly expand during the War of 1812. Okay, guys, uh, that's it for the notes today. If you have any questions, make sure you uh, let me know. Have a great rest of your day.